Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. That's, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today. First over for some housekeeping rules. Thanks very much, Christina. Um, good morning, everyone. And welcome to this webinar, which is part of the IUCN's um, Vital Sites, the Journey to Marseille series. And today's webinar explores how CAMLAR and the new BB&J Treaty can save half the planet. Um, while we wait for a couple of folks to, to join on, uh, we wanted to briefly review um, some of the housekeeping rules. So first of all, uh, you'll note, I wanted to note that we are recording this webinar and we intend to share it via IUCN shortly after we conclude. Secondly, um, I wanted to note uh, that because we do have such a large group on today, participants are in listening mode. So your, your video is off and your microphone is muted automatically. We do, however, want this webinar to be as interactive as possible with such a large group. So we wanna ask that you please raise any questions or comments that you have within the Q&A box at the bottom. And we'll try to address as many as we can in our very limited time together. And uh, if you have any technical problems, please reach out to me via the chat function um, at the bottom, which you should be able um, to, to send me a message there and happy to, to work to address that. Um, and with that, we've got such a great panel today and we're excited to have you all. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for today's session, Christina Gerdy, who is the High Seas Advisor to the IUCN, Senior High Seas Advisor to the IUCN, and also a world-renowned expert on international ocean law. Christina, thanks so much for joining us and over to you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me today to uh, stand in for our um, beloved Ambassador David Bolton that so unfortunately can't be here. But um, I have known Ambassador Bolton for a long time because we have um, been talking about the areas beyond national jurisdiction, the high seas for many years. That he was um, uniquely able to listen and to learn. And we hope that um, this session today also provides a wonderful opportunity for all to listen and learn from one another. And we hope to learn from you through the question and answer sessions. Uh, we have a remarkable panel um, of five experts today that whom I'll introduce as we go from session to session. First to say that we've been discussing conservation of the Southern Ocean and areas beyond national jurisdiction since 2002. The World Summit on Sustainable Development adopted a um, joint plan of action that called for um, developing representative networks of marine protected areas by 2012. Needless to say, we're a little bit behind, but we're hoping that we can learn from the lessons in the Southern Ocean on how we can kickstart this process once the BB&J agreement is actually negotiated and signed, we can rapidly be on our way to implementation. That's our session today is divided, as I said, into three parts. The first is gonna talk about the science behind mapping priority areas for conservation and protection on the high seas and in the Southern Ocean. We'll have um, a talk by two speakers about the data-driven approach to highlighting priority areas in ABNJ, areas beyond national jurisdiction. And then we'll be joined by Dr. Mercedes Santos, she'll be talking about the, science, um, the Southern Ocean. The second session will be onto the policy um, challenges and opportunities with how the BBNJ Treaty and CAMLAR can support protection for priority areas, an overview of the policy challenges and opportunities with Liz Karen from Q and Dr. Cassandra Brooks from the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, third part will be questions and answers, and we've actually dedicated 25 minutes to this. So we are hoping that you will start to share your thoughts, your questions, your suggestions in that chat box as soon as possible. Uh, so first, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Douglas McCauley and Morgan Vasali from the University of Santa Barbara, University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, Doug McCauley is Professor of Marine Science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, he is a Sloan Research Fellow in Ocean Sciences and serves as the director of the Benioff Ocean Initiative, a really cool applied research center at UCSB that uses science, data, and technology to resolve threats to ocean health. Check out the recent stuff on ocean whales and shipping. 
Uh, Morgan Vasali is a project scientist at the Benioff Ocean Initiative at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She works in um, applied marine research at the intersection of science, technology, and communications, and now policy. So I'll welcome these two to take the floor and start um, showing us their presentations. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Christina. And it's a real pleasure and privilege to share this morning. What uh, Morgan and I and uh, Ben Best, who's joining us here in the background to help field any questions that may come up about uh, technical elements of our presentation, um, is a view of a data-driven quantitative approach for trying to prioritize or highlight areas in areas beyond national jurisdiction that are hotspots, good candidate area, hotspots of biodiversity, good candidate areas for consideration of protection in these high seas regions. So sort of put another way is that we're so excited by the work that many of you are doing um, within the BBN shape process within Kemlar, try to think about uh, best fit areas and create policy tools for protecting those best areas um, in this really important region of our oceans. And what we want to do from the science community is stand beside you to help reinforce your efforts if there, for example, within the BBNJ process becomes a mechanism, becomes a policy tool to protect these regions, that we have good data-driven insight to help select which might be some of the highest IQ areas deserving of protection. And that's deserving both for biodiversity and to meet goals for maximizing benefit for people that use this space. So I want to acknowledge here, as is mentioned in this slide, that uh, this analysis that we'll share and the outputs from it are the result of contributions from colleagues from 14 different research institutions. And uh, their intellectual contributions really help shape this in a very formative way. Um, next slide. One thing that I'd like to look at and talk about together, um, in fact, is a, a major mix, mis misconception. In fact, I think I'll treat two misconceptions about the high seas before we dig into the actual analysis and the data and some of the results. And the first of the misconceptions that I think is in circulation about the high seas is that it's an empty place. It's a big blue desert, void of human activity. And I think nothing could be less true for this space. Next. The data that really helps shape for me um, or um, eliminate that misconception is this um, data visualization here, which is a compilation of about a year's worth of vessel tracking data that includes much of the high seas. And you can see when you look at vessels, this includes fishing vessels, this includes shipping vessels, you get a sense of the sort of busyness of this space. Next. And I think many of you, which are really um, have your fingers on the pulse of changing patterns in human use of the oceans, are well aware that we have something of a blue acceleration going on in our oceans, or a kind of industrial revolution, revolution that's beginning in our seas. And that includes the speeding up and onboarding of brand new industries. And that's acceleration of agriculture and shipping, mining, marine energy, and while many of these activities are starting in the EEZs, they may well, and many are planned, to already have a footprint out in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Now, all of this new activity means that some of our opportunity to think about where are optimal solutions for protection on the high seas are going to become more and more constrained. Our options are going to be shrinking as to what we can do to maximize that benefits I mentioned for biodiversity and people in the high seas. Next. The second and the last mix misconception I'm going to share before we actually dive into looking at this analysis, this planning analysis for hotspots in the high seas, is that we don't know much about areas beyond national jurisdiction. There's not a lot of data to help us in this exercise of trying to find and highlight biodiversity dense regions. Now, as a marine biologist, I always want more data. My kids are going to want more data. My kids, kids, kids are going to want more data on the oceans. Let's hope I have a long lineage of ocean scientists. <clears throat> That's to say we always dream and hope and wish to have more data in front of us to make good management and policy decisions. But we're actually very, very privileged right now in that just as there's a revolution that I mentioned about new industry in the oceans, there's a revolution about new ways to sense remote regions, including areas beyond national jurisdiction that are being made from remote sensing by new technologies to help us go farther, deeper, um, and cover more regions and get more insight about the high seas. And that's created a huge amount of a huge wealth of information about where the biodiversity is using the high seas, um, where biodiversity is located in the high seas, where people are in the high seas. 
which leaves us in a perfect position, as far as I'm concerned, in a really responsible position to start thinking about these prioritization exercises. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Morgan in just a second, but she's gonna share some insight about some of these data assets that I'm mentioning here. In fact, 20 billion data points worth of data assets that go into this exercise. So that's all to say that we know a lot and we can leverage a lot from the data that we have for the high seas for these kinds of planning exercises. Morgan, why don't I go ahead and pass over to you to, to take us in to look at some of the data assets and then of course the planning model itself that took us towards this prioritization, these prioritization outputs for areas beyond national jurisdiction. Sure, thank you, Doug. Um, so as Doug mentioned, the analysis that we undertook is basically a prioritization process, a bit of a cost benefit analysis for the ocean, trying to identify these really um, biodiverse, rich hotspots that could be uh, potentially important areas for protection out in the high seas or marine areas beyond national jurisdiction. And so we pulled in 55 global data layers into this planning exercise. And um, don't worry, I won't walk through them all, but I'll give you a little sampling here, of some of the core classes of data. So you have a view of the different building blocks that we used in this marine um, protected area planning activity that we did. So one of the largest data sets that we pulled into this algorithm is species richness. And this is basically a measure of the total number of species potentially present in an area. So in the actual optimization process, we actually broke this down into 23 different layers representing individual classes of biodiversity that have special ecological, taxonomic, or economic values. So for example, whales and dolphins, corals, tunas, we tried to optimize protection for all these different groups of species. And so in total, this accounts for over 12,000 unique species of vertebrates, invertebrates, and marine plants in the high seas. So of course, um, you know, as our climate is changing, our oceans are changing as well, and species and locations in the ocean are likely going to change as well in, in uh, response to this. And so we wanted our marine protected area optimization process to be able to build candidate MPAs that both protect biodiversity today and in a future potentially altered by climate change. And so to do this, we also pulled in forecasted distributions for these same marine species in 2100. So this data was provided by Aquamaps and basically they combine projections for how we think the ocean is likely going to change with what we know about the types of ocean conditions that different species prefer. And that allows them to basically predict how the ranges of these species might shift in 2100. And so we saw some predicted movements of species, for example, moving from some of the warmer waters to cooler latitudes. Just as on land, we have endangered species like you know, rhinos and elephants in the ocean. We, of course, too have endangered species and we wanna use these marine protected areas to potentially help protect these at-risk populations as well. So we also pulled in spatially explicit data on species endangerment curated by the IUCN Red List via contributions of leading ocean scientists from around the world. So again, trying to prioritize protection of places where we have a lot of endangered species, like the leatherback you see here. In addition to um, you know, looking at where species are located now and where they might be located tomorrow, we also saw a lot of value in pulling into the planning process key marine habitats that provide homes or services for high seas biodiversity. So seamounts and hydrothermal vents like the one you see shown here are two important habitat types in the high seas. Seamounts are undersea mountains that provide homes for special forms of life like corals that can live to become the oldest living animals on the planet. Seamounts are also really important aggregation sites for migrating species like whales and sharks. And hydrothermal vents are these wellsprings of energy that fuel these otherworldly ecosystems with species found nowhere else on Earth. So these are two really important physical features that we wanted to make sure we prioritized as well. We also wanted to integrate ocean productivity, so plankton at the bottom of our high seas food chains, as a way of pinpointing areas that are likely the fertile crescents of the high seas, supporting protective and diverse food webs and ecosystems. When we then zoom down to the depths of the sea, we wanted to also pull in information on habitat diversity on the seafloor. So this is beyond you know, obvious features like seamounts and hydrothermal vents and includes other variables like sediment type and oxygen content. 
And the reason for including this data in the planning process is that areas that have a high amount of um, habitat diversity often also host a high diversity of life. So as I mentioned, our MPA optimization process is kind of like an ocean cost benefit analysis. And so what I've shown so far are the biodiversity features that we would like to include in protected areas in order to reap the benefits of increased ocean resilience, thriving biodiversity, fewer extinctions of ocean species. But we also included information of the potential costs of, of protecting these areas. And so in this optimization process, the principal costs drawn in was potential loss of access to key fishing areas. So while we do find it interesting that to note that around 97% of industrial fishing on the high seas comes from wealthy nations and 86% of this fishing effort comes from just five countries, we do want to provide a mechanism in the optimization process to minimize potential short term impacts to fisheries. So these important fishing areas shown here on this map in the darkest red essentially get kind of carved out of the MPA solution unless they are exceptionally rich in other biodiversity benefits. And so that's part of the cost benefit um, analysis that the algorithm considers. So now we've covered some of the data inputs. and I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about how the data was actually analyzed. And I'm going to be um, very brief here in my description of the mechanics of it. But if you're interested in digging in deeper into how the algorithm works, um, I would definitely recommend checking out the um, paper. It was published open source in the journal Marine Policy. So you can access that. Um, and my colleague, Dr. Ben Best and I are also here for more technical questions at the end of the presentation if you're interested. So the optimization algorithm that we use is called Prioritizer, and it seeks to find something akin to a Venn diagram. So places in the high seas where we would be able to protect the most biodiversity while minimizing costs. So again, in this case, having the least impact on potentially important fishing grounds. And within the framework of this algorithm, we set minimum targets for each biodiversity feature that we wanted to be included in the MPA network. Cetaceans, sharks, corals, um, seamounts, hydrothermal vents, all the good stuff that we want to be protected. So in this iteration of the model, we elected to set the target at 30% for each of the 54 biodiversity features. And this was inspired in part by a resolution passed at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in 2016 that stated that at least 30% of all marine habitats should be protected. So the algorithm then looks at all the input data layers and decides which areas to pull into the marine protected areas in order to meet these 30% targets while minimizing the potential cost to fishing. The algorithm is a bit more sophisticated than just stacking all the biodiversity layers and uh, protecting the areas with the most good stuff because again, we wanna protect 30% of each feature, some of which might be quite rare or only found in a very specific part of the ocean. And so the algorithm takes that all into account in order to produce an optimal solution for the way that you've parameterized the model. So when we actually parameterize the algorithm as I've described and, and allow it to run, here are the high priority areas for protection that it identifies, shown here in dark green. So you can see high priority areas for protection are relatively equally distributed across the ocean basins. And also shown over here on the right is an indicator of the amount of high priority areas identified at different latitudes. So later on in the webinar, you'll hear from some of our colleagues about the importance of protecting the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. And this is reflected actually in our global results as well. You can see a little spike here um, in priority areas for protection at these low latitudes. So as I mentioned, we require the algorithm to find areas in the ocean that meet, meet a minimum 30% target for each biodiversity feature but some do better than others. So shown in this graph, I'm just showing you um, a sampling of a few features here. Remember there are over 50 such layers. But you can see that it was really easy for the algorithm to pull in over 60% of seagrasses in the high seas, likely because there's not very much seagrass habitat in the high seas and it's mostly all concentrated in one area off of Madagascar. So it was easy for the algorithm to just grab all that seagrass habitat. On the other hand, the algorithm just met the the minimum 30% target for seafloor habitat diversity and ocean productivity, for example. So again, what we're highlighting here in this map is an MPA solution that in some cases just meets this minimum 30% target for some key habitats and species. 
So for, you know, if any of you are scuba divers, for example, if you were told that you needed an absolute minimum of 30% air in your tank to survive a dive, I suspect that you wouldn't fill your tank to just 30% full, especially if the ocean currents were strong and the visibility was kind of bad, you'd want to have some extra air. And certainly right now, you know, we're in a moment where um, the oceans are turbulent and uncertain with ocean heat waves, ocean acidification, other stressors that are just beginning to accelerate. So studies have shown that 30% protection is really the minimum that is needed. And that's what this map here reflects. But, you know, I could imagine a future where even more than 30% of high seas biodiversity features are protected. And this data-driven approach that I've described here is here to support that planning for that future as well, if needed. So one of the exciting prospects about applying this data-driven approach that uses freely available open source code that anybody can access is that it creates a very open, transparent, and flexible process that can be adapted as new data becomes available or if priorities or targets change. So my hope is that this study contributes not only this map of potentially high priority areas for protection, but also a flexible framework for marine protected area planning on the high seas. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Doug to dig, to dig a little bit deeper into our results. Thanks, Morgan. Very quickly, a couple of points. One is that, uh, as Morgan mentioned, this is powered by a model, an algorithm, which um, sets up a kind of um, dichotomy that we find in lots of different uh, areas of decision making life, where you have a model that's telling you one thing, but you don't want to also miss out an insight from expert humans, by far our most uh, sophisticated model yet on the planet. One thing that we're advantaged in the areas beyond national jurisdiction is that we've always already had um, uh, a huge amount of insight that's come from people that have created what are called EBSAs or ecologically and biologically significant areas. And we can look at overlap between the model and these EBSAs. Happily, there's an immense amount of overlap between the model solution and EBSAs. Um, next slide. Um, as I say, the, the results are very clinical here with the model shows up, but the stories actually run deep. Of course, as a data scientist, we tend, all of us, to focus on the data and the data results. But there are an immense amount of uh, really wonderful biological narratives that you can unpack in each of these different regions that are highlighted in that rather prosaic looking um, green layer. I won't really have time. I know I'm just about out of time here to go into some of those stories, but I encourage you to go ahead and check out the Pew Report, which takes you beyond the data into the stories of undersea mountain ranges and aggregations and oases of biodiversity in all of these hot spots in the oceans. Why don't we go ahead and pause there to make sure that we don't transgress into time for some of our other presenters. But uh, thank you for the chance to present this data. And as Morgan mentioned, to read more or to dive deeper into the analysis, there is the supporting peer review paper. Thank you. Thank you, Doug and Morgan, for those stunning images and the clear explanation of how one starts to elucidate these priorities. I also appreciated the 30% analogy with that tank of uh, air that's having experienced a little bit of a high current once myself. Uh, precaution is um, always the, the better approach. Gives me pleasure now to uh, introduce Dr. Mercedes Santos, uh, who's going to be taking us down to the Southern Ocean. She is the National Director of Marine Protected Areas from Argentina. She is attending this meeting in her former capacity as co-leader the research on the MPA proposal for the Western Antarctic Peninsula led by Argentina and Chile. Her research interests focus on the conservation of the ocean, particularly on marine spatial planning and socio-ecological systems. Welcome and thank you, Dr. Santos. While we're waiting, we'll have a chance to um, have a few questions, a couple questions on the science element after this first session. So please um, send your questions away. Hello, good morning, good evening, and thank you very much for, for this invitation. I will talk about the domain one MPA processes. And this is a project that is led by Argentina and Chile and my colleagues from both countries. And we also have the contribution of many researchers around uh, the Camelar environment. So the Southern Ocean is under the frame of the Antarctic Treaty System. 
And, um, and one important component of this system is the camera, the camera, which is the Commission of the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, which it's the it applies to the south of the uh, Antarctic Convergence, which is the convention area. Its objective is conserving the Antarctic marine life, and one of these mandates that we have is to create a representative network of MPAs around the waters around Antarctica. We are a little behind schedule on this task, but and I think that Cassandra will speak a little more about that. And I will focus on what is what is the process in domain one, which is a one way that this waters was divided in domains. This is domain one, which represents the Western Antarctic Peninsula and the south of the Arc. And we will focus on that. So domain one is it's one of the most productive areas of the Southern Ocean. It has a complex coastal circulations with favor retainers and plankton transport within the coastal regions. And because of that, we have large foraging grounds with large aggregations of birds and seals and whales. It also provides important ecosystem service. It is one of the most, it is where the krill fishery, the commercial krill fishery is mostly developed here in this region. It's also the most visited place by tourists and it provides a service in, in climate regulation. The potential threats that this area is facing are the effects of climate change and also the krill fishery activities and with that, I mean, it's not about the catch limit, the current catch limit, it is about the concentration of the fishery that might impact on the predator's performance. And there are some, now there are some um, proof of that, that has been published. But and, and an MPA is much more about, it's not only about science, it is, it is an, an uh, iterative process between science and public and, and, the, and policy. And in this case, I will focus on, on what is the, the science that drives the, how we create the science to inform or drive policy. Our process is starting particularly in 2012. We, we run different um, international workshops. We, we may uh, found, we follow the advice of the researchers. We come back with results and every like, we can say that every six months we, we come on back and forward to, to, to share our, our work and, and receive feedback. And from other, other countries, because this is a multinational approach. Even if we are leading the proposal, this was a multinational approach. The main objective that we want to achieve in, in, in the Western Antarctic Peninsula NPA proposal is the conservation of biodiversity. That was our overarching. Uh, of objective. And then we have particular objectives that allow us to, to achieve this one. And we, in this, during these workshops, we choose the conservation objects that allow us to, to fulfill these conservation objectives. And, and in this vision, in these ecosystemic visions, we went from, from benthic and geologic habitat to processes and species, and important areas for predators and prey species. And I will show you quickly, quickly what the objectives are, but I want to highlight the importance of, of having open source data that allowed us to, to, to have a robust process and a robust analysis. And also, I want to thank many uh, researchers that share their data, even without being published at that time, but to, to allow us to, to understand which were the priority areas for conservation. So we have benthic habitats and pelagic habitats, and also we identify important benthic processes like shelves and ice shelves and canyons, and pelagic ecosystem processes like polinias and the Antarctic circumpolar front and some productive areas. Regarding the, the birds and mammals, we uh, identify the foraging areas and we weight them by their size and also the, the, no, the, the colony size and, and also we and they identify the buffers around their colony. So we define them according to the species and according to the site where, where they are breeding. But another important objective is to protect the, the areas where the, the distribution of the prey 
that are important for predators, and that is also considered in the, in the analysis. We also include the foraging distribution during the non breeding season of some species uh, of cetaceans and also penguins and pelicans in the same area. Another important objective is some species of fishes were overexploited in this area in, in the you know, decades ago. So we wanted to, to give a special attention to that. And we dis divide this between the spawning habitat and the, the current areas too. And then we identify the criminal sites. Lastly, as, as uh, was mentioned today, the, the seamounts were also considered as, as areas of importance. With all this information, then we, with, with the, the group of researchers that attend the, the, the workshops, we discuss what was the target, the level of protection that we want to give to each of these conservation objects. And, and we discuss for each of them, we decide to be medium or, or le, le, no, low, medium, and high level of protection. And then we run different analyses with this. And with those results, we share again with the, the researchers. This is like in that time, it was not so used. We were not used to have these virtual meetings. Nowadays, it's more common, but we used to come with that all the time. And we shared that we found that the second, the medium scenario was the most um, reasonable uh, decision. So we run these marks and analysis, and we identify the priority areas for, for conservation. This which are in blue, these are not an MPA, these are, these, are the, these are the areas that for different reasons are important to protect. And on top of that, what we have done is to um, split or to consider the domain one in three different ecoregions, which is the south and the north of the Antarctic Peninsula and also the, the south of the the Antarctic Peninsula, it was split in, in those two because it is, the north is more variable, more warmer, more vulnerable to climate change, while the south is more resilient and stable and, and, and colder. And we also have the differences between the Antarctic Peninsula and the, and the South Orme area because South Orme is, is also influenced by the weather sea, uh, by the weather sea and between these two areas, we have two different management effects. So these were our three main regions that identified. And after that, we designed the MPA model. And this is an evolution from 2017 to 2019. And in this case, what we, what we have done is to introduce a preliminary proposal to share with the, the other members of Camelar to, to see the to receive the feedback before coming with a, a, a proposal of conservation measure. This this evolution among among the changes in this model is is a, a compromise between different members' interests, but all the time that we make a change, we come back to the science, into the, the baseline, the baseline data, all the, the analysis that we had, and make all these decisions, checking that if we were still achieving the objectives that we agreed to, to protect. And so another step in, 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 in our model, what we have done is this iterative process is where once we have that identified the priorities areas for conservation, we use the new information that comes uh, during the, that arrived during the last years, and we use it as a background information, or even some of them we use it to modify the model. And in this case, I will specifically highlight the, the work that have done by, by George Waters and Emily Klein and, and Adrian Dahu that they use our model they, they, and they contrast our model to, with their own research to know if this MPA was strong enough or we, and it, it will work in the future or we need to uh, make some changes and they, they suggest and we can use it or not. But it was a, a very productive and iterative process that helped us to, in my, in, in my vision, to make it more robust. Um, proposal like 
In this case, like we, we they profile the benefits and costs associated with this MPA and, and what was the cost for the machine. So nowadays, the final model, this is in 2019, and we are stick to this model at this point. In the south of the Western Antarctic Peninsula, we have, we have two general, uh, two management zones, the general protection zones and the field fishery zones. In blue, the general protection zones is where no field fishery is allowed. We have in the south, we have this large, you know, no take so in the south to increase protection for Antarctic krill. This has a positive impact in krill biomass and krill predators in the north. And also we we decrease fragmentation and to improve an operational operational management of these zones. And in the south, the blue zone, the blue square that you see in the in the north of the Antarctic Peninsula is because we wanted to protect important areas for krill and for predators. And also we want to have this connectivity with the weather CMPA proposal. And why we have also the free fishery zones where inside the MPA the, the free fishery is allowed because we and we open some areas for the fishery but because we want to allow the redistribution of the catch location. We want to avoid spatial temporal concentration of the free fishery. And we want to properly monitor this activity. If it is part of the MPA, it is part of the research and monitoring plan that is associated with this proposal. So finally, this MPA took into account the conservation we want because we want to want to we want sorry to protect Antarctic marine living resources and the ecological relationships among them. We want to allow the rational use, and that's why we have the creep fishery zones. We took into account the creep fishery displacement, and we will we will monitor the creep fishery activity through the time. Climate change was included in this gradient that we designed in the in the MPA model. We try to replicate as much as possible all these different uh, the conservation of different species along this this region and we also consider the, these models, the, the predictions that that uh, take into account different climate change scenarios. And also the MPA, the, the more, one of the most important uh, support of the MPA is to have the study, this study area to, to check that the MPA flow objectives are being achieved, to check for variability and the changes in the ecosystem. So this is all. Thank you very much for, for this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Santos, um, for a fascinating presentation. I will um, charge right in with one question very specific to you, which is, uh, would the general protection zone have conservation measure Kamler Conservation Measure 24.01 um, regarding scientific and research fishing um, attached to it in this proposal. Yes, the, the research the research fishing is allowed, not the commercial fishing. Great. Okay. And um, thank you. We'll uh, go. We have one for Doug and Morgan, which is about um, incorporating, and maybe Morgan, you can um, addresses it's about the case of socioeconomic data and your choice to um, exclude areas of fishing interest and um, person is asking about how do you incorporate other values and interests beyond just high seas fishing and are not are you not trying to um, exclude other types of interest in focusing your model optimizing your model for high seas fisheries since there's just so few states and then a subsequent question, is there a way to optimize these models to also take in, for example, uh, coastal connectivity um, in regards to species and processes and, and structures? Thanks. Sure, thank you, Christina. And I can take a first stab at this and then Doug, feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. Um, so one of the you know, challenges of running a global analysis like this is that you are limited to globally distributed data. And so that was part of what drove us including this global fishing data set. 
Um, in the paper itself, you can also see we did actually run the model without the phishing data included as a cost layer. So in that case, the algorithm is trying to minimize the overall just area of the solution. And so that is available in that paper if you're interested in checking that out. And that could be potentially the map that um, could be used in these processes if, if that value set was um, was, was expressed. I would also mention that if there is, you know, socioeconomic data that is available on a smaller spatial scale, not a global scale, it's possible to actually rerun the model, not at a global level, but at um, a smaller spatial scale, incorporating that data as well. So kind of just depending on the spatially explicit socioeconomic data that is available. Um, but there are other model runs in the paper that I'd recommend checking out if you're interested. Um, Doug, I don't know if there's anything else you would add. Sure, and Christina, I can also just pick up uh, the connectivity question. There is some actual relatedness between those two. Um, Morgan, I don't know if it's easy to share a slide, um, if you still have the power to do that. Um, the, the relationship between connectivity, I think also, and, um, and these two questions about other goals for managing human use in the high seas is that uh, certainly within an EEZ, um, an area adjacent to an uh, uh, area beyond national jurisdiction, there may be a lot of goals beyond fishing, for example, thinking about marine conservation, thinking about protecting important marine um, assets for tourism, um, for other uh, values that uh, biodiversity protection within EZ allows. And one thing that I think you can do, thanks for bringing that up, that was exactly what I was thinking of, is that you can look at some of them and, um, and plan for some of that uh, protection by looking at uh, proximity of some of these um, uh, high seas priority areas to EEZ conservation regions. This is one example. So this is a, uh, a region um, probably many of you are familiar with, a uh, super uh, biodiverse region, both structurally, bi uh, structurally heterogeneous and biodiverse, but packed full of all kinds of species, Salus, Igomez, Zinaska ridges. It's an under collision of undersea mountains and it actually backs up to a set of really important protected areas within a EZ. So for example, if one of the goals was to maximize biodiversity conservation within EZ um, to get values that come from these within state MPAs, you could do that by simply looking at the proximity of these high seas um, MPAs, Canada MPAs to those within EZ Canada MPAs and maximize some of those other values that come to states within their EZs and through conserva biodiversity conservation. Also, just briefly on the question of connectivity, this is also a really good example about uh, thinking about how to include, maximize, um, and highlight the important service of connectivity in this design process. So there's more to be done to uh, explicitly pull in information on con connectivity into these planning exercises. Um, but one thing that the algorithm here does is, as Morgan described, it tries to clump together um, areas that are um, heterogeneous in the seafloor. So it tries to pull in, for example, aggregations of seamounts. And that's also what this is. As I mentioned, this is a, a bringing together of different seamount chains, which for um, the vantage, from the vantage point of connectivity, are really important, really important corridors for movement back and forth, both in the here and now. Species may be transiting over the course of their lifespan across different habitats, but it's also a really important corridor it would foster connectivity in the longer term. So these different seamounts that are clumped together because of the way that the algorithm works actually can be stepping stones for movement in a climate altered ocean. So in many of the same ways, we'll have climate refugees. Unfortunately on land, we'll have climate refugees in the oceans and having these different pinpoints, these different seamounts clumped together provides stepping stones for, um, for the migration of these climate refugees. So more to be done, and actually really quickly, um, maybe if, since we're here, more in the next slide, um, there, there is a, a next really exciting exercise that can be done. And this is just a base layer for thinking about planning that could pull in, that should pull in information about animal movement. This is just a, a compilation from a recent nature paper of uh, tens of thousands of tracks from dozens of different species moving across the Southern Ocean and into the high seas region. You can pull that information together and can also plan around that information in future um, versions of this kind of planning process. And it's pretty illustrative too. We compartmentalize our conversations about Camelar, Southern Ocean, BB and Shea within EZs, but uh, life in the oceans doesn't to that point, to the very heart of that question on connectivity these species are telling us think more broadly. Happily, I think it's a special thing that our, our webinar here is including conversations about BB&J 
right next to conversations about Kamalar and the Southern Oceans because if I was to channel my inner Antarctic humpback whale, that's precisely what they would want us to do, acknowledge that connectivity. Thank you, Christina. Beautiful, Doug, Morgan, and uh, Mercedes. Uh, with that, I think we'll have to switch over to our session two, the policy component of this discussion, because it gives me great pleasure to introduce Liz Karen, who is leading Pew's work to protect the ocean life on the high seas, a global effort to safeguard marine life beyond national jurisdictions, where currently there is no method to fully protect these special places. Liz Karen has 20 years experience working in the environmental community with a diverse background in international marine conservation, climate and energy policy, business development, and marketing. And she certainly always keeps us on track and on goal. So Liz, it gives me great pleasure to turn this over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. Apologies while I'm uh, getting that set up and unmuted. Um, and, and thank you very much. I think that that was a very robust session, um, both on the uh, importance in, in identifying protected areas uh, in the high seas and in the Kamala region. And I'm happy now to take us on a tour of the policy mechanisms that can are in place for protecting those areas or the potential for policy mechanisms to protect those areas. So. Um, just to quickly, um, let's see, there we go. Um, just to quickly uh, run through this, because I think a lot of time was spent in the earlier session, the importance of the high seas. The high seas makes up over two thirds of the world's oceans um, and nearly half of the planet's surface and is home to what scientists believe is one of the greatest reservoirs of biodiversity left. Um, a lot of it is actually unidentified. Um, you know, uh, scientists have projected that nearly 200,000 and as many as a million um, spe species are still yet to be discovered um, in the high seas. Um, the high seas also support some of the world's largest fisheries um, and provide essential habitat um, areas. Over 40% of commercial, commercially important fish species are caught in both coastal waters and the high seas. And marine fisheries directly or indirectly uh, employ over 200 million people uh, and high seas fisheries account for up to $16 billion. Um, and then of course the high seas pr provide critical ecological functions uh, such, as, such as oxygen production, um, ca carbon capture and storage, and are essential for the support of human life. Um, the oceans absorb about 40% of CO2 emissions um, and estimated uh, economic value of carbon storage in the high seas range from uh, 74 billion to $222 billion a year, US. So again, I think, you know, Doug and Morgan did a good job of providing an overview of the activities that are going on in the high seas um, that are potential threats to biodiversity. Um, fisheries remain the, the most, um, uh, uh, the largest impact of biodiversity on the high seas um, and global fisheries continue to decline. Um, high seas uh, deep water and deep water fisheries have uh, been increasingly exploited as a result of technological developments and growing market demand um, and destructive fishing mes mes methods such as deep sea bottom trawling threaten high seas biodiversity. Um, and then shipping around 90% of world trade is now carried by international sh the, sh the international shipping industry um, and pollution from these ships, including noise pollution, uh, threaten the high seas environment. Um, and then ongoing climate change, including ocean acidification, uh, pose a severe threat to deep sea ecosystems in particular, uh, leading to geographic shifts in environmental gradients, uh, which likely affect habitat integrity and representativeness, uh, redistribute species and change um, communities and uh, composition and interactions. Uh, and then there's deep sea mining, which seems poised to transition from the exploration phase to a uh, commercially exploitation phase. Um, uh, and the full extent of, and damage of these mining operations will, uh, that they will cause is, is uncertain. Um, however, it is known that you know, deep seabed mining will inevitably cause environmental damage um, to the habitats uh, on the bottom of the ocean, uh, as well as from sediment plumes that will likely uh, 
interact and affect uh, marine life even um, miles uh, away from the, the mining sites. Um, and then there's uh, activities that are, are still emerging or future activities uh, that have yet to be imagined, uh, but geoengineering seems one in particular that is of concern to which there is no um, uh, management of the, uh, currently. So um, one way to protect against these threats um, are through the marine through marine protected areas. Uh, and marine protected areas are one of the most powerful tools for protecting habitats, species, and areas that are critical to marine life. Um, they safeguard biodiversity. Studies have shown that significantly higher biomass and abundance of species within reserves um, compared to similar areas that are unprotected. Uh, top predators and um, they protect top predators and maintain ecosystem balance so marine reserves hold greater better benefits for top predators such as sharks and tunas um, and studies have shown that biomass uh, uh, can increase exponentially uh, in predatory fish populations for up to 18 years after reserves have been established um, and mpas build climate resilience um, or build resilience to climate change uh, by enhancing lo the local resilience of populations and ecosystems um, and acting as buffers against climate related stress. Uh, and then uh, recently I just wanted to mention uh, there's an MPA guide that was released uh, as part of a joint project of scientists at Oregon State University, the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas, uh, Marine Conservation Institute, National Geographic, and the UNEP World Conservation and Monitoring Center that shows that highly and fully protected areas in particular that are effectively managed um, yield the greatest benefit for conservation and biodiversity protection. Um, and these MPAs uh, provide an important pathway towards 100% sustainable ocean. So, um, you know, science shows that uh, protecting at least 30% of the ocean um, is important to maintaining a healthy and balanced ecosystem, ocean ecosystem around the globe. Um, and there's growing political support for a 30% target. Um, government alliances, such as the Global Ocean Alliance, which is led by the UK, um, the High Ambition Coalition, led by Costa Rica and France, uh, and their proposals under consideration at the CBD uh, for the um, post 2020 biodiversity framework that would include, potentially include, uh, a new target uh, for MPAs of protecting at least 30% by 2030. Um, and high seas can play an important, have an important role to play um, in achieving that global target, considering um, how much area the, the world's oceans, the, ice, the high seas comprise. Um, but currently, uh, the high seas remain largely unprotected. Uh, less than, uh, only about 1% of uh, the high seas are protected in any kind of MPAs and less than 1% in highly and fully protected areas. Uh, and you can see uh, on this map that this, the, primarily the areas that are protected are uh, in the Southern Ocean and the Ross Sea MPA. Um, um, so part of why uh, that is, is that there's no global mechanism that um, uh, provides for the establishment of high seas MPA. While, while there is a very um, robust system of high seas governance, uh, primarily under the UN law, the Convention for the Law of the Sea, that um, regulates fishing, fishing uh, through RFMOs, shipping through the IMO, International Maritime Organization, and seabed mining through the International Seabed Authority. Um, there, uh, there is no part uh, or, um, that operationalizes the conservation um, mandates within UNCLOS as well. Um, there are, on the other side of the, this chart, you'll see the regional seas conventions and the multilateral environmental organizations um, that do sometimes have uh, touch on these issues, but there's no focus um, for high seas uh, marine protections in particular. And that is uh, with a little bit of license on my end, apologies to the authors of this graphic, but um, that is the potential for BB&J um, to sit, uh, obviously still a parent or still a child of the UNCLOS system, um, yet uh, very much uh, uh, integrated into the uh, and benefiting from the work done on the environment side of the, the field as well. So 
the conversations uh, at the United Nations and globally around the need for high seas protections um, has been called a long and winding road, uh, including by Christina her herself, um, and has taken a long uh, time for us to get to the place where we are now, um, considering a final agreement, or considering um, draft text of an agreement for uh, high seas protection. So, um, you know, as early as uh, 2004, the United, uh, the United Nations um, started an ad hoc working group uh, for protection to, to discuss more fully uh, what would be needed for high seas protections uh, and uh, study the issues more closely. Um, that process lasted roughly until uh, 2011, uh, where uh, it was uh, a package was developed. Um, so the importance of the issues have been ex uh, exposed, uh, and then there was a, elements of a package uh, for negotiation was agreed. Uh, it took another several years uh, of pre-negotiations or prep comms um, for uh, that package to be uh, developed more, to understand more fully what would be necessary with regards to protections in the high seas and these elements. Um, and then since, uh, and then, then in December 2018, the internet, the Intergovernmental Conference for, um, uh, sorry, December 2017, the Intergovernmental Conference uh, for the negotiations, uh, formal negotiations for High Seas Treaty started. Um, so we got three meeting, three, uh, four meetings in um, before uh, our final meeting was postponed, uh, which was supposed to be in spring of 2020 because of the COVID uh, pandemic. So we are hopeful that that process will continue uh, and be picked up in spring of 2021. Uh, so that package of elements that I mentioned um, uh, includes four elements, uh, area-based management tools, environmental impact assessments, uh, marine genetic resources, and capacity building and tech transfer. Uh, and the one that we're going to focus on uh, most relevant to MPAs is uh, the ABMTs package. Uh, so ABMTs, there's no uh, um, agreed upon um, or standard definition for, for area-based management tools. Uh, but Costa Rica, uh, we think, said it well, uh, defined it well in earlier submission, that their regulations or measures of human activity in a specified area to achieve biodiversity conservation or resource management objectives. Um, and you can see within there, uh, within ABMTs, uh, there are many tools in the toolbox, uh, including MPAs, uh, regional tools, uh, regional seas organizations, or regional um, uh, mechanisms, sectoral management mechanisms, uh, and then future tools. Uh, but as you can see, MPAs really provide uh, the most flexible tool um, and the most options for uh, comprehensive management of the marine environment. So similarly, um, there's not yet an agreed upon definition for marine protected areas within the agreement. Um, there are others definitions, uh, the IUCN definition and the definition uh, within the Convention of Biological Diversity um, that are good models. Um, but roughly a MPA in the context of, of that we're talking about within the BNJ is a uh, geographically defined marine area where human activities are regulated, managed, or prohibited in order to afford comprehensive protection. And then um, wanted to take the map that Doug and Morgan showed earlier and um, compare it to uh, the map uh, the map they showed earlier of um, sort of highlights of uh, places that are of biological biodiversity importance within the high seas um, and contrast that with uh, the very busy map that shows the patchwork um, of governance uh, and uh, overlapping uh, mandates in geographic areas of uh, management of different um, ocean governance bodies. And I think a couple of things become clear in looking at these maps side by side. Um, one is that there's no organization that has the authority, mand mandate, and competence to create comprehensive multi-sectoral uh, marine protected areas. Uh, of course, Camlar stands out as a notable exception, though Camlar doesn't itself manage all human activities in the area. 
um, but it's protections, it established benefit from sort of multi-sector pr uh, protections afforded by the broader Antarctic treaty system. Um, and then also that the future BB&J agreement will not operate in a vacuum um, and must carve out its own clear mandate for common conservation management of the high seas biodiversity within this crowded playing field. So then just to touch on um, this relationship to other bodies is one of the key um, questions that the negotiators um, at the BB&J negotiations have to unlock. Um, and uh, as part of that, uh, this concept of not undermining what's already out there has risen um, as, a, as a key tenant of the negotiations. Um, but I think it's helpful to, to emphasize that not undermining um, does not mean not overlapping, um, and it does not mean not weakening. So BB&J agreement, as I said, can um, uh, exist alongside these other bodies. Um, it can have its own mandate for conservation management um, without taking uh, or minimizing the mandates of existing organizations. Um, and the key will be how, how can it do so in a way, uh, in partnership with other organizations, uh, in a way that uh, um, moves conservation management forward um, at all levels within the high seas. Um, so, Talking a little bit about some of those synergies might be um, with other bodies, uh, facilitating cooperation between overlapping uh, and neighboring bodies, so it's the geographic scope of things, um, enhancing science cooperation across organizations and institutions, um, establishing complementary measures that can amplify and support measures that are adopted by other bodies, and to provide a cross sectoral or cumulative impacts perspective. Um, I think. Uh, I think you know, Doug noted it well when he was talking about the ecological connectivity um, issue. There's also a governance connectivity issue as well, and the BB&J agreement can play a role in, um, in, in that governance connectivity. So key elements that'll help advance this um, and conservation in the high seas and particularly um, what is uh, what we're looking for within the High Seas Treaty, an effective global agreement um, that includes global decision-making by a conference of parties. Um, ideally, that would meet uh, every year, have a review conference um, to make sure that it's on track with meeting its objectives. Um, and that, uh, you know, the function of that body should include standard setting, review uh, and decision-making, monitoring, uh, ensuring compliance, uh, facilitating and promoting cooperation and coordination, um, and administering global information um, through a repository such as a clearinghouse mechanism. Um, the ability to, to design um, the body, the an effective agreement should also uh, include the ability to design or to designate globally recognized and enforced MPAs, including marine reserves on the high seas, um, as well as to utilize other area-based management tools. Um, to do so will require, uh, you know, having clear objectives, um, proposals with conservation management measures included, uh, robust consultations with other stakeholders, uh, scientific body review, decision making, implementation, monitoring and review. Um, and then lastly, uh, an effective agreement should have a robust environmental impact assessment uh, because uh, we aren't necessarily envisioning uh, the entire high seas being an MPA area, there will be other activities, like commercial activities, industrial activities happening in the high seas. And it's important to ensure that those activities are happening or are moving forward uh, in a way that does not uh, negatively impact um, biodiversity. So ensuring sustainable use and sustainable management. And EIAs have a, environmental impact assessments have a key role to play in that. Um, for uh, determining the threats of human activities, um, including fishing and mining and shipping, um, but also uh, activities that aren't regulated by um, existing bodies, such as um, geoengineering, offshore aquaculture, um, and, and who knows what the future will bring. Um, so we have great expectations for 2021. I know, uh, as many of you know, 2020 was going to be the super year of the oceans. Um, and uh, I think uh, there's still been good conversations and strides forward even during these 
difficult times. Um, but uh, definitely moving forward in the coming months uh, and into the next year, we'll have some of the key meetings um, to decide some of uh, the future of ocean protection, um, both on the high seas. Um, uh, so, some of that will happen, uh, and some meetings will happen this year as well. But uh, for the high seas, it'll be in 2021, um, and then also for the uh, um, potential for protecting at least 30% of the ocean um, as well in 2021. And I just wanted to note that the um, there's a leaders pledge for nature that was uh, um, announced uh, around the UN Biodiversity Summit that happened a couple of weeks ago, where um, now it's up. It says, now we're up to over 75 countries, I believe, have signed on to that, this initiative by the UK and others. Um, and one of the key pieces of that is um, call it a commitment towards uh, negotiating uh, the High Seas Treaty and completing the neg those negotiations at the upcoming uh, meeting of the International uh, Intergovernmental Conference. So uh, we look forward to holding governments to that pledge um, and to a successful conclusion of the negotiations in 2021. With that, thank you. Thank you, Liz, so much. It has indeed, indeed been a, a long and winding road, but one that we can see light at the end of the tunnel. And um, it's exciting to see that 2021 is already um, building up to be an exciting and opportunity-filled year that was with all these governments coming forward in support of real protection for our ocean planet. Um, so to turn now to the southern part of the, the world, um, it gives me pleasure to introduce Cassandra Brooks, who is an assistant professor in environmental studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. She draws on a diversity of disciplines, including marine science, environmental policy, and science communication to study and seek solutions to pressing environmental problems with the last 15 years of a career focused on marine conservation in the Antarctic. We're excited that she will join us in these discussions on the high seas today and the Southern Ocean. Cassandra, over to you. Thanks so much, Christina. Excellent. So what an honor it is to join this amazing group of speakers first, just to say uh, for this webinar today. And I need to start by taking you back to Antarctica, this icy continent at the bottom of the world. And I want to share with you that before the continent was discovered, the ancient Greeks insisted that a great southern land must exist in symmetry with the north. Without it, they said, the entire earth would topple over. And I love this metaphor because the Greeks were more right than they knew. Since its discovery, scientists have documented that the Antarctic stores 90% of the earth's freshwater, regulates our climate, and drives global ocean circulation. And despite its harsh conditions, the Antarctic waters teem with life. Indeed, the Antarctic contains some of our last healthy marine ecosystems left in the world. Part of the reason we have healthy systems in Antarctica, around Antarctica, is that it's been protected by ice and remoteness. It's really far away, but it's also political will. In the Antarctic, we have a rich history of science and exploration that has created a framework for international collaboration. And I want to highlight the scientific collaboration of the 1957-58 International Geophysical Year, which led directly to a political collaboration and the signing of the Antarctic Treaty in 1959 at the height of the Cold War. It set aside the entire continent for the sake of peace and science. And I have to pause and emphasize what an incredible feat this was. The Antarctic continent is a de facto world park. We have not done this anywhere else in the world where we actually set aside diplomatic tensions and found common ground on such a large scale. The Antarctic Treaty is truly one of humanity's most marvelous achievements. And as you heard about already is uh, another convention under the Antarctic Treaty System, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources or CAMELAR, which manages the waters around Antarctica. In line with the principles of the treaty, grounded in science and precaution, CAMLAR is considered a leader in marine resource management. They currently have 26 member states, those flags in front of you, and they meet every year over a two-week period in Australia to negotiate policy decisions, all of which have to be made by unanimous consensus. Currently, there are only two main commercial fisheries in the Southern Ocean. The largest by far is for Antarctic krill, a small shrimp-like crustacean, and as Mecha mentioned, the key prey species in the Southern Ocean food web. They support large, the large populations of birds and mammals that we find in the Southern Ocean. 
krill are actually primarily harvested for use as fish meal and omega-3 pills, so not usually not direct human consumption. The other main fishery in the Southern Ocean is for Patagonian and Antarctic toothfishes. And these are opposite of the krill. These are the top fish predators in the Southern Ocean. And toothfish are actually sold as Chilean sea bass, though they're not from Chile, nor are they sea bass. Uh, and they support a lucrative international fishery and market, especially in the United States, Europe, and Asia. They're also known as white gold because they fetch such a high price. Although my favorite name for toothfish is one of their Spanish names, Bacalao de Profundidad. And it translates to cod of the deep or to profound cod. And they truly are a profound fish. I could talk to you at length about this fish. They have amazing polar adaptations, like having antifreeze in their blood. And toothfish were actually the reason for my first foyer into Antarctic research. As a graduate student, I fell into a study investigating their life history to provide information for managing a growing fishery in the Ross Sea, Antarctica. And perhaps some of you are surprised that we're fishing in the Antarctic. These are literally the most remote fisheries on Earth, with fishermen risking life and limb operating in the world's most dangerous waters. But this is in line with global fishing trends, with the Antarctic emerging as a resource frontier. This figure from the Food and Agricultural Organization illustrates the problem really well, showing that by 2008, 90% of our global fisheries were either fully exploited, overexploited, or collapsed. That leaves only 10% developing or underdeveloped, and many of these populations are in the Southern Ocean. This map gives you an idea of fisheries operating in the Antarctic today. Each flag on the map represents a vessel from that country which notified to fish. The peninsula, which if you can see my cursor is over here, the area Mecha was talking to you about, and the Ross Sea, this area down here, are where most of the vessels go. Meanwhile, the system is struggling to adapt to climate change. The Antarctic is among the fastest changing places on Earth, and the story is complicated with a lot of uncertainty and trends, though the figure in front of you tries to summarize, red, red being areas warming, blue being areas that are cooling. In general, the Antarctic Peninsula, again, this area over here that uh, Mecha was talking to you about, is warming dramatically with impacts throughout the whole ecosystem. So what do we do? Well, you heard from Liz about a lot about what marine protected areas are and what they do, but again, just that they are uh, areas where human activities are restricted to meet specific conservation, protection, or fisheries management objectives. And they're an increasingly popular tool for conserving marine biodiversity, including under environmental change. And Liz summarized this already, but just to share with you one figure, the, the reason they're increasingly popular is because especially no-take marine protected areas, known as marine reserves, they improve ecological outcomes, leading to more diversity of species in greater numbers and larger sizes. And this is just one figure of many I could show you illustrating that. So working towards international targets, which have called for a global network of MPAs, Kamler has argu arguably been leading the way on the high seas. Working towards a Southern Ocean wide representative network of marine protected areas since 2002, since that call Christina mentioned, and the map in front of you shows the nine planning domains that Kamler has designated to help guide this work. One key priority area of protection was in the Ross Sea, and I want to tell you the story of this place. In a global assessment of human impacts on the world's oceans, the Ross Sea actually stood out as being perhaps the most intact or least damaged of all marine ecosystems left in the world. It's the most productive stretch of waters in the Southern Ocean. This is actually a photo, photo from NASA taken from outer space of the annual summer Ross Sea phytoplankton bloom. And as the most productive stretch of the Southern Ocean, it supports disproportionate marine life, including 35% of the world's Adelie penguins and 25% of the world's emperor and penguins. And I need to highlight the efforts of uh, Dr. David Ainley pictured before you who had been working in the Ross Sea for decades. And he saw the threat of the fishing industry early on and began advocating for protecting this place, arguing that we need this last place kept intact as a living laboratory so that scientists can study how a healthy marine ecosystem functions. In 2002, he actually submitted a paper to Kamlar making his case for protecting the Ross Sea as a living laboratory. And over the course of the next many years, he galvanized the support of hundreds of scientists from all over the world. Early on in this process, David's obscure paper got the attention of Boulder-based conservation photographer John Weller, and they teamed up to tell the story of this place, branding it as the last ocean. While I was still researching toothfish in the Ross Sea, John actually found me, and he convinced me to join this last ocean project. 
He then convinced me to move to Boulder, to marry him, and to have his children. <laughs> and I have so many stories I wish I had time to share with you today of this journey, about the flood of media that we created around the Ross Sea in support of its protection. Working with international conservation partners, including members of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, to bring the Ross Sea to policymakers. The award-winning documentary film we made, led by New Zealand filmmaker Peter Young. In the stunning photography book we delivered into the hands of all Camlar decision makers. The millions of public citizens which engaged in this campaign. And I wish I had time to share with you the flood of science generated in support of protecting this place. And how in 2010, the United States and New Zealand began working to develop a proposal for a Ross Sea Marine Protected Area and their efforts over the next many years to develop and modify the proposal, seeking to find trade-offs that would not compromise its conservation value. In this moment, I knew I had to get into the room at Camlar, into these closed door negotiations. And since 2012, I've managed to occupy a spot in the very back of the room <laughs> at Camlar to study and participate in discussions. I wish I had sufficient time to share with you the stories from within the room at Camlar, who meets, as I mentioned, every year in Hobart, Tasmania, in Australia to make policy decisions, and of the diplomatic negotiations over a Ross Sea MPA, which went on until all hours of the night as diplomats worked to find a way forward to reach consensus. In the moment, largely due to the engagement forged by Pew Charitable Trusts and others, when former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry actually took on the effort for a Rossi MPA and wanted, he decided he wanted to achieve it during his term. The stories from the White House when President Obama incorporated a Rossi MPA into part of climate negotiations with China, or the incredible efforts working within Russia to find the political levers of influence, which would finally lead us to consensus. The graphic on your right tries to show you that slow and difficult process of working with individual countries over time as they join a consensus, in this case, towards adopting a Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. This was a long and difficult task that took many years of iterating the boundaries of the MPA as countries negotiated trade-offs between protection and fishing, now and into the future. In the years of geopolitical tensions, which actually had nothing to do with the Antarctic, but spilled into the negotiation room. And it literally took the efforts of hundreds of scientists, thousands of conservationists, and millions of global citizens over the course of more than a decade. But ultimately, it required the political will of the Camlar member states. And I want to share with you that moment in the room on October 28, 2016, when after 10 years of working towards this effort, including five years of intensive negotiations, Camlar finally came to consensus. The room exploded in applause, nations were hugging nations, and it became clear that this was not just an environmental win and a gift to the future, though it was both. It was like the signing of the Antarctic Treaty as a peace treaty in the height of the Cold War. This was a diplomatic win, and it showed that despite tensions between some countries, the Antarctic continues to be an exceptional space dedicated to peace and science. This is a map of the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area that the Camlar office actually printed after its adoption. And they invited all the delegates in the room to come and sign it. And it was clear that it was an immediate source of pride for Camlar. And at more than 2 million kilometers squared, and 70% of that is off limits to fishing, it is still among the world's largest MPAs. So reflecting back, how did we get consensus on this marine protected area? Well, we worked at the intersection of science, policy, and the public. And Mecha also noticed that, that uh, with the Antarctic Peninsula Marine Protected Area, they've been working for almost 10 years at this interface to try to drive it. And this is where we need to work. And I cannot underestimate that the role of public engagement, the huge scientific effort combined with high level diplomacy, negotiating trade offs, building, and at times breaking and rebuilding trust, working with opportunities for leadership which all led to this political window of opportunity. And there's a critically important element that intersects the science policy public interface, and that is the role of individual people who elegantly navigated this space were critically important. So the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area is just to start. You can see it here at the bottom of the map. Camlar committed to a network of marine protected areas that would represent biodiversity and key ecological areas throughout the Southern Ocean. There are three more critically important marine protected areas under negotiation at Camlar, including in the East Antarctic, 
the Weddell Sea and the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which is the one that Mecha talked about today. And the map in front of you shows you uh, the other MPAs on the table right now. And Domain 1, or the Antarctic Peninsula MPA, is it's in an area that is one of the most threatened regions of the Antarctic. It's among the fastest changing places on Earth. And as she mentioned, it's also the location of a large commercial fishery for krill. The cumulative impacts of environmental change in fishing deem immediate conservation action here. For me, it's become very personal. <laughs> I want my children, including my daughter, Adeli, who you can see here, who is named for the penguin, to actually live in a world thriving with Adelis. And we now know with certainty that our global oceans are stressed. We know that our lives literally depend on a healthy ocean. And the future of all of our children demand that we act quickly to reverse these trends. We know protected areas are one of the most effective tools we have. And this is a map of our global progress so far. So this is a global map, map of marine protected areas in the world. More than 6% of the global ocean is protected. So we have a really long way to go to get to 30% and to ensure that protected areas are representative of species and ecosystems, which is what international targets are calling for. The high seas is even less protected. Currently only 1.3% of international waters are encompassed. And Liz showed you this picture as well. And you can see, as she mentioned, that the majority of these protected areas and international waters are in the Southern Ocean. Fortunately, we have the work we heard about earlier today from Morgan and Doug to guide us. Now we just need countries to act. So just in closing, how do we secure high seas marine protected areas? Well, if we've learned anything from the Ross Sea story, we need high level diplomacy, continued scientific effort, like the excellent studies we heard about today, engagement from conservation organizations and public pressure and support. So essentially we need all of you and everybody involved. So thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Cassandra. It's lovely to see all those photos and the ones of your little children that are now practically all grown up. They, they were still in process when we first met. Um, that was, it's been a delight to hear from you all. And as I realize time is running out, we're going to try to combine some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, apologies to those whose questions that we don't quite get right um, in our efforts to speed along. That was, um, so this is for everybody. And since Cassandra just mentioned climate change and it's um, impressing the urgency for action upon every, all of us, um, as well as nations, how do we take into account both climate change and the inherent nature of the ocean as a dynamic environment? How do you all think MPAs and MPA networks can best take into account shifting species, populations, and dynamics? And we'll just go around. Uh, Cassandra, we can start with you and then we'll go um, up the road. And please keep your answers short, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I, I feel like I, I touched a lot upon uh, climate change and I do, I do feel like uh, seeing some of the work of forecasting what is the future going to look like and how can we create marine protected areas that are actually considering future scenarios or as some people are working on, how do we, could we create marine protected areas that are dynamic themselves that actually can uh, move across the oceans as we need to. And, uh, and that to me would be a very exciting and possible, it is possible thing. <laughs> Mercedes. Yes, one, one of the issues that we're trying to address this is create large non-take non zone in the south that trying to accomplish with to that changes in the future. Um, I agree that mobile MPAs could be a, a good, it, it, it is a good idea. I'm thinking about the implementation within, at least in Camilla. Uh, I don't know if, if it is so easy. We, we have going through discuss, some discussions about that, but also some people need non-take zones for long periods and those two visions are difficult to balance. So for us at this point, even if it is a good idea, I don't see a good way to implement that within at least camera. Thank you. I think that is an important distinction. We need some permanency. We need some long-term protection. Um, there may be other ways that we can account for the dynamism of species and ecosystems, but perhaps in other places they may be appropriate. Um, Doug, uh, Morgan, and, and Beth. Ben, please join in. 
Thanks, Christina. Yeah, I think um, I think this is a crucially important question. Um, it's almost like trying to do planning in an area like the Southern Ocean and the high seas is like trying to come up with a chess strategy for protection, but the cells on the chessboard are changing because our ocean is changing. But if we actually mean to win with these strategies, we're gonna have to take into account that change. I mean, that's in part, and maybe Morgan, you can share a thought further, but that's in part why we try to pull information about climate change into this prioritization and this planning exercise. Happily, we have a sense um, from climate modelers, from climate biologists about how those cells are shifting. So we can try to do this design process that includes where we see biodiversity now, where we expect it to be in the future, and how to set up protected areas that may include both good spaces for biodiversity now and those good spaces where biodiversity may be in the future. But Morgan, Ben, I don't know if you have more to share. Um, yes, yeah. welcome. <laughs> so great to be here. Uh, yeah, um, I, I would say that, yeah, in the existing uh, Visali et al. paper uh, that we contributed, that was definitely part of the thinking of now and into the future. Um, there's a, this larger topic of just management and in, in how responsive human activities could be to uh, MPAs that are shifting. And when we're talking about uh, places like the high seas, where you, you would imagine that there's a significant amount of technology, it's not, we're not talking about artisanal local fishermen that are going out into the high seas. So the given AIS, uh, the automatic identification system with ships and the two-way communication and satellite, I mean, we're moving into an area and a, a time period in which it is reasonable to assume that we can offer this just like maybe, you know, these biodiversity hotspots are just like traffic in the ocean, just like you wouldn't drive through Los Angeles without ways or some other traffic mapper and you wouldn't drive into the high seas or some or the the southern ocean without understanding um obstacles and roadblocks and they're already obviously using that so why why can't we um incorporate um these biodiversity concerns uh into uh that routing system and make it a matter of course so thank you i like that waves for the ocean um uh, morgan did you want to add here and then liz will get to ask you a, a different question um, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, as, as Doug and Ben mentioned, there's a lot of great brains that have done a ton of work to not only do the climate and ocean modeling, but to understand what types of conditions these species um, like to live in. And so we can really combine all of that great information to then, you know, project out into the future. Where do we think these species might show up? And in our approach, we combined both biodiversity now and biodiversity in the future to try to optimize for both. And if you check out the paper, you'll see it's interesting. We actually ran the model also without the climate forecast data. And our, our results show that you actually, um, it's actually you know, pretty easy for the model to protect biodiversity both now and, and into the future using the data that we included. So um, I think that there are great opportunities for us to protect biodiversity both now and in our climate altered future. Excellent, thank you. Um, Liz, I'll let you have a, a go at this question, but I'm hoping you might also add in something on the role of other effective conservation measures or other area, other types of area-based management tools and a place for those in the BB&J agreement. Thanks. Um, sure. Uh, so I think that um, you know we are right now in the process in the BB&J negotiations of creating um, a legal mechanism for the establishment of MPAs. So basically, writing as it were. Um, you know, what are the ingredients that are be needed to put into an MPA proposal? Who would be consult? How you know who would be consulted? How those consultations would go forward, um, and then what would be in place with regards to um, ensuring proper implement effective implementation, uh, and then monitoring and review. So it, you know, it's it's very much at a, at that nuts and bolts policy level. I think where the rubber is really going to hit the road um, is in the future MPA proposals and how those are designed and what considerations and science is taken into consideration um, in those proposal designs. Um, you know, obviously with you know, potential species uh, migratory paths changing and um, you know, populations 
um, being um, affected, you know, species populations being affected, mobile species in particular as a result of climate change. Um, you know, a lot of, there's been a lot of great work that's been emerging on that. I think in the coming years, there'll be a lot more that will, um, uh, and in fact, maybe some real time data as to how species are adapting to climate change that can inform uh, those future proposals. Um, and I think, you know, uh, as well, um, I, you know, I don't, I, I would imagine that some of these MPA proposals, uh, similar to the ones in Camelar, uh, are not going to be monolithic um, marine reserves necessarily, but have different zones, uh, as it were. So, you know, identified areas that are particularly um, important uh, as no-take areas, um, and then as well areas where there might be, by necessity um, or because of other activities, uh, you know, other activities, industrial activities happening, whether that's shipping um, or fishing. Um, or other activities that may have uh, may be seen to have a rather negligible impact on biodiversity that can can carry forward. So, uh, and that's where the role of um, ABMT, what we call in, in within the high seas negotiations, other ABMTs, other area based management tools, can come in. So, sort of using those um, other management measures that that um, that complement the conservation uh, the conservation objective of the ABMT, but but still allow for some activity. And there is an, an, uh, an analogy here to be made with OECMs, which is a, is a term that's more common uh, within the Convention of Biological Diversity. Um, but uh, because it is within a different uh, convention, and that term hasn't been defined within the UN um, high seas negotiations, it's, it's hard to say whether it's uh, um, it could be imported wholesale as a concept or definition. Thank you very much. I think that is a very important um, answer and um, ongoing discussion that needs to be addressed. Um, I realize we are just about now out of time, but I would love to get a final um, takeaway message from you all, if we can go around the, the table. And I'm just gonna start with a plug for a webinar that IUCN hosted yesterday on integrating climate change into environmental impact assessments. And as soon as that is posted on the IUCN and Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative site, I hope you'll all have a chance to take a look into it because climate change is truly changing everything. Doug, I'm going to go by order of the speakers here. Please, one final takeaway message. Two words. Thank you, Christina. Um, urgency and opportunity. I think, um, as we said, um, things are changing fast in the oceans. And so our opportunity to uh, the, the opportunity to actually set up some of these protected areas in thoughtful places that maximally benefit biodiversity and people, that opportunity is shrinking. And then, you know, really, opportunity. Um, I think we're looking at one of the most fascinating times ever in the history of the oceans, what we have, the decisions we're making in uh, the high seas and in, uh, in Kemlar. And I'm really excited to see that go forward. And please know the science community stands ready to help all of you um, bring assets and tools to the table to back the decisions that you make. Fantastic. That's a very important offer. Uh, we'll take you up on it, and I hope the governments do too. Uh, Morgan. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to all the speakers. It's great to join you here today. Um, just to build on what Doug said, I mean, we have amazing data out there to support these processes and to support these policy forums. And there's more data coming out all the time. And so, um, yeah, I just stand with Doug and being at the ready to um, help support from the science side as these policies move forward. And, um, you know, you're, we're in good hands with all of you. So thanks so much. Excellent. Ben, I see you nodding your head. Two words. I concur. No, <laughs> I do concur, obviously. And um, I just, I guess I would love to emphasize that, that this, um, these tools that we used are open source. All the code for all that analysis is up online. And just like there's adaptive management, there can be adaptive research to address the needs uh, for the, uh, the policy at hand and as new data becomes available. So we should just be able to turn that crank and get better results and adapt with the times. Open source data, fantastic. Um, Dr. Uh, Santos, please. Yes, you can say my chance, Dr. Santos. <laughs> and I'm thinking about in the convention area and camera convention area, and I think that there is a huge work done by different countries to create a network of MPAs. There has been a lot of research, a lot of energy put on this, and, and I think that all the network around Antarctica is mature enough to be adopted, and I wish that we can do that sooner than later. 
you know, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, Liz? Yeah, I think I would just say that, you know, with all the myriad threats that are facing um, our oceans uh, in general, and then the high seas in particular, uh, there is no silver bullet. Um, it's really going to rely on the entire spectrum of uh, the ocean governance system to work, to find a way to work together um, and to work, uh, you know, and for the BB&J system to work with um, the existing other structure um, to really advance meaningful um, marine conservation in the high seas um, and really take that system beyond the status quo because it's pretty obvious from um, you know the headlines and the scientific data um, coming out that that what we're doing is not you know what we're currently undertaking is not effective um, the oceans are um, you know, biodiversity in the oceans are declining the state of the oceans are in decline um, and we need to do something new and the bbnj treaty has a, a chance to take that um, in this take us in this new direction Time to go beyond the status quo. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Cassandra, please. And then I'll put Nicola on the spot to uh, provide some final words and closing out. Thanks. Thank you. First of all, just thank you so much for uh, for the participants who came, for uh, for those of you presenting here with me. Uh, it just was such an honor to be part of this conversation. Um, a quick plug for uh, those of you who want to learn more about the Antarctic Peninsula Marine Protected Area, National Geographic is premiering a documentary on Sunday evening. <laughs> Mage is laughing there. Mage is in it, uh, and uh, it's, it's a really great documentary on the threats to the Antarctic Peninsula um, and the efforts there to protect it. So uh, if, you, if you just go to National Geographic, geographic and, and look up the Antarctic Peninsula. That's literally what it's called, the documentary. So check that out. And just to end with, hopefully if my story uh, showed anything, it said, I think, I think we have to be we have to be dedicated, we have to be ambitious. A lot of what we talked about the, today, the efforts we talked about, Christina, you could speak to this, the BBJ process, a lot of people would have said, that's impossible. Like, we can't do high seas protected areas. I remember being told early on in my career, you can't do Antarctic marine protected areas. Like, it's international waters, and yet here we are doing it. And so I think us being ambitious and optimistic is, is what we have to be. Amen. Ambitious and optimistic. I think that's what keeps us going and that's what keeps us together. And we need as many people involved as possible. So thank you all for joining. And I'm honored to be here and excited about the wonderful science that we have learned and new ways to apply the science for better manage of this vast global commons, which is indeed half of our planet. Nicola, over to you. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, this this was really a fabulous webinar, um, and and so great to hear from all of you, um, lovely panelists and experts. I, I know I learned a lot today. Um, just to note that we'll we'll aim to circulate this recording um, very soon, and we'll also include a couple of other links to some of the resources um, and documents and reports and papers that have been mentioned today. So that um, if you weren't able to catch them within the Q and A, um, you'll be able to catch them in that follow up email. Um, and with that, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you.